and the first section of federal law, we will cover a brief history of the laws affecting pharmacy. Acts and amendments that directly affect pharmacy are taught in this section. In the practice of pharmacy, there are many laws, both state and federal. The PTCB will only test the candidate's knowledge of federal law, which is covered in this section. We will first discuss the federal laws that affect pharmacy. In 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed. This law required all foods and drugs to meet a standard of purity and strength. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act was passed. This law regulated drugs that produced physical or psychological dependence, the importation, sell, manufacture, and use of cocaine, opium, marijuana, synthetic agents, and derivatives of these drugs. In 1938, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed. This law required that manufacturers of drugs and cosmetics must prove that their products are safe and that all medical devices must be proven effective. This was the first law that gave the FDA limited authority to remove products from the marketplace if they are found to be ineffective or unsafe. Then, the Durham-Humphrey Amendment was passed. This law is supplemental to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This amendment further clarified the distinction between prescription and over-the-counter drugs, based on whether or not the drugs were habit-forming, narcotic, hypnotic, or potentially harmful. In addition, it required a physician's consent in order to dispense refills, giving rise to the legend, Caution, Federal Law Prohibits Dispensing Without a Prescription. This must be affixed to prescription containers for Schedules 2 through 4 drugs. In 1962, the Kefauver harris Amendment was passed. Again, another amendment to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act became law. It required drug manufacturers to prove the safety and effectiveness of their products before approval was given by the FDA for marketing. In 1970, the Poison Prevention Packaging Act was passed. This was the act that required pharmacists to use child-proof packaging. In 1970, the Controlled Substances Act was passed. This classified drugs based on their potential for abuse, Schedule 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This will be covered in greater detail later in the course. In 1990, the obra Nanny Act was passed. This required pharmacists to offer counseling to Medicaid patients regarding medications. In 1990, the Anabolic Steroids Control Act was passed. This act places any drug or hormonal substance chemically and pharmacologically related to testosterone under regulatory provisions of the Controlled Substance Act. This was a result of bodybuilders and athletes abusing these drugs for building body mass. In 1997, the FDA Modernization Act was passed. This act changed the legend from Federal law prohibits dispensing without a prescription to Rx only. This change will be phased in by February 2003. Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938 and Regulations of the U.S. FDA The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, enacted by Congress in 1938, has as its primary purpose preventing interstate distribution of foods, drugs, cosmetics, and devices that are adulterated or misbranded. This purpose is achieved through numerous requirements in the Act and FDA regulations. Introduction The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the historical development of the FDCA and its predecessor. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 the candidate should also be familiar with amendments to the FDCA. Since 1938, 
including the following. Durham Humphrey Amendment of 1951. Kefauver Harris Amendment of 1962. Medical Device Amendment of 1976. Orphan Drug Act of 1983. Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act of 1984. Prescription Drug Marketing Act of 1987. Safe Medical Devices Act of 1990. Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. Food and Drug Administration Modernization Act of 1997. Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act of 2002. Medical Device User Fee and Modernization Act of 2002. Pediatric Research Equity Act of 2003. Minor Use and Minor Species Animal Health Act of 2004. Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004. Dietary Supplement and Non-Prescription Drug Consumer Protection Act of 2006. Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007. Key Provisions of the FDC In 1957, thalidomide, a new wonder drug, was introduced in Europe. It provided relief to grateful expectant mothers suffering from morning sickness. Sadly, the medication was causing many thousands of children across the globe to be born with severe deformities. We do not know for certain how thalidomide caused birth defects. It may have shut down blood vessels in growing babies, causing abnormal development of organs. The tragedy of thalidomide babies was largely prevented in the United States by a new medical reviewer at the FDA named Dr. Francis Oldham Kelsey. In 1960, Dr. Kelsey, a pharmacologist and physician, had only been at the FDA for a month when the application to sell thalidomide under the brand name Kevadon came across her desk. She felt the drug company's evidence was lacking and insisted on having the scientific proof that thalidomide was safe before the application could be approved. Over the next year, the drug company often complained to her superiors, yet the FDA stood by her decision. Toward the end of 1961, researchers in Germany and Australia were beginning to link thalidomide to the sharp rise in certain types of birth defects, and countries feverishly pulled it from the marketplace. Dr. Francis Oldham Kelsey was hailed as an American hero. A grateful President John F. Kennedy presented her with the Distinguished Civilian Service Medal. Because thalidomide was sold in dozens of countries, we will never know the number of babies that were never born because of the drug. What we do know is that countless others were saved by an everyday hero. The worldwide thalidomide tragedy did lead to some positive reforms in the United States. The Kefauver Harris Amendment to the 1938 Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act was a direct response to the thalidomide tragedy. The 1962 legislation required that all new drug applications demonstrate substantial evidence of the drug's effectiveness. In other words, the drug had to show that it would do what it was advertised to do in addition to being safe. The Drug Efficacy and Safety Initiative followed. It mandated that drugs approved between 1938 and 1962 be reviewed to establish that they worked. Drugs that were shown not to work could be removed from the market. In July of 1998, under the absolute strictest safety standards, thalidomide was approved by the FDA to treat a skin problem caused by leprosy. In May 2006, it was approved for the treatment of a type of cancer called multiple myeloma. It's currently one of the most highly regulated drugs in American history.
and into Friday. Tessa? Thanks, Tom. Well, it's been 30 years since the Orphan Drug Act was approved, paving the way for drug companies to develop treatments for rare diseases. In fact, sales of orphan drugs, orphan drugs have surged nearly 26 percent between 2001 and 2010, and that's faster than the growth of traditional drugs for more common diseases. And as we hear in this report, that progress is helping people with an extremely rare condition. A rare disease is defined as any condition affecting fewer than 200,000 Americans. They're more common than you may think. There are actually about 7,000 of those diseases recognized in the U.S. affecting almost 30 million Americans. So everyone knows somebody with a rare disease. Some of them are diseases like cystic fibrosis that most people have heard of, uh, but there are many like short bowel syndrome that uh, probably most of your viewers have not heard of. Short bowel syndrome affects about 10 to 15,000 Americans. It results from the loss of a large amount of small intestine. That leaves patients with too little bowel to absorb fluid and nutrients that they need to survive. Doctors work with these patients to try and maximize the effectiveness of their remaining bowel using medication and dietary changes. But for a large number of patients, it's still not enough. Many of these patients require uh, intravenous nutrition called TPN. This is a specialized form of intravenous fluids that they infuse on a nightly basis over about a 10 to 12 hour period. More recently, the FDA approved a drug called Gatex, which actually enhances the absorption of the bowel and has potential to get patients off of TPN. The National Organization for Rare Disorders, or NORD, is a great resource for patients with short bowel syndrome, as well as any of the other 7,000 rare diseases. Visit rarediseases.org to get the facts. The content of this segment was provided by NPS Pharmaceuticals. Sometimes you're under the weather. Other times you're over the handlebars. The Drug Administration Modernization Act directed the FDA to create a way to fast track new drugs to help more patients. Local 5 Shelley Botot shows us what's getting the green light from the FDA and what these breakthroughs mean for patients. Under this act, drugs can be designated as fast track if they meet two criteria. The drug must show promise in treating a life-threatening condition and it must address an unmet medical need. Right now, celiac disease and major depressive disorder are two conditions that have new drugs racing down the FDA fast track. Researchers are on the fast track to develop a drug to treat major depressive disorder in patients who don't respond to standard therapies. The company's drug influences the opioid pathway, but in a non-addictive way and is designed to be taken once a day. About 16 million people in the U.S. suffer from MDD in a given year, the majority of whom may not respond adequately to antidepressant therapy. Another potential breakthrough that has received fast-track status is a drug that could diminish gluten-induced intestinal injury in patients with celiac disease. Currently, there are no approved therapies. Patients' only option is to attempt to follow a strict, lifelong, gluten-free diet. Celiac disease is the most common autoimmune disease, affecting more than 2 million people in the U.S. The FDA receives approximately 100 to 130 applications a year and has stated that close to 80 percent of all filed applications will eventually be approved. Last year, only 22 drugs were accepted. And that's your Health Watch. I'm Shelley Botot, Local 5 News HD. All right. Well, thank you, Shelley. The holidays. Key provisions of the FDCA. The FDCA is located at Chapter 9 of Title 21 of the United States Code. Chapter 9 has the following nine subchapters. I short title. Two definitions. Three prohibited acts and penalties. Four dot food. V drugs and devices. Six cosmetics. Seven general authority. Eight imports and exports. Nine miscellaneous. The MPJE candidate should be particularly familiar with subchapters 2, 3, 
V, which is divided into subparts A through E, and 6 and with the following sections within the subchapters of the FDCA. Subchapter 2 Definitions 321 Definitions, generally The MPJE candidate should be familiar with all terms defined in this section of the FDCA, which will aid in Understanding the language of the sections that follow The candidate also should be able to distinguish between terms such as drug, counterfeit drug, new drug, device, dietary supplement, food, and cosmetic. Subchapter 3 Prohibited Acts and Penalties 331 Prohibited Acts The MPJE candidate should be familiar with conduct that is prohibited by the FDCA, as set forth in this section. 332 Injunction Proceedings this section provides that the U.S. District Courts and all courts exercising jurisdiction in U.S. territories have jurisdiction to enjoin violations of Section 331, with some exceptions as set forth in this section. Furthermore, an alleged violation of an injunction or restraining order shall, upon demand of the accused, be tried before a jury. 333. Penalties the penalties for violation of the FDCA range from not very severe to very severe. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the penalties, and particularly those related to the prescription drug marketing. Violations, i.e., drug samples and distribution of human growth hormone. Notice the use of the term. Knowingly, as defined in Section 321. 334. Seizure. This section describes the process related to seizure and disposition of adulterated and misbranded foods, drugs, and cosmetics, a process with which the MPJE candidate should be familiar. 335. Hearing before report of criminal violation. This section provides that before any violation of this chapter is reported to a U.S. attorney for criminal proceedings, the person against whom the proceeding is contemplated shall be given appropriate notice and an opportunity to present his or her views, either orally or in writing. 335A Debarment, Temporary Denial of Approval, and Suspension This section describes the debarment from submitting or assisting in the submission of applications for drug approvals of businesses and individuals based on prior misconduct related to the drug approval process. The MPJE candidate should be able to distinguish the various characteristics of mandatory and permissive debarments. 335b. Civil Penalties. This section continues the matter of misconduct in the drug approval process. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the conduct prohibited and the associated penalties, together with the provision concerning informants. 335C. Authority to withdraw approval of abbreviated drug applications. This section authorizes the withdrawal of approval of abbreviated drug applications if the approval was obtained, expedited, or otherwise facilitated through bribery, payment of an illegal gratuity, or fraud or material false statement. Withdrawal is also authorized if the manufacturer has repeatedly demonstrated a lack of ability to produce the drug for which the AP application was submitted in accordance with the formulations and manufacturing processes set forth in the application and has introduced, or attempted, to introduce such adulterated or misbranded drug into commerce. This section also provides procedures for withdrawals. 336. Report of Minor Violations this section provides that the Secretary of Health and Human Services, HHS, is not required to report for prosecution, or for the institution of libel or injunction proceedings, minor violations of this chapter. Whenever he or she believes that the public interest will be adequately served by a suitable written notice or warning. 337. Proceedings in the name of United States, provision as to subpoenas. This section requires that legal proceedings for enforcement or restraint of violations be in the name of the United States. 
However, this section also allows states to bring actions under the Act, but only on no ties being given to the HHS Secretary as set forth in this section. Subchapter 4 Food Although this subchapter is titled Food, the MPJE candidate should review select sections because they contain requirements related to dietary supplements. The MPJE candidate should review the portions addressing dietary supplements in the following SE sessions 341, 342, 343, 343 to 1, 343 to 2, and 350B. In addition, the MPJE candidate should review section 350 on Vitamins and Minerals Subchapter V Drugs and Devices Part A Drugs and Devices 351 Adulterated Drugs and Devices A drug or device can be adulterated for several reasons, as listed in this section. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with these reasons. 352. Misbranded Drugs and Devices a drug or device can be misbranded for several reasons, as listed in this section. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with these reasons. 353. Exemptions and consideration for certain drugs, devices, and biological products. A key section of the FDCA, this section, among other things, exempts legend drugs from the general labeling requirements of the FDCA including when sold when a prescription is presented. Note the label. Requirement of the Rx only symbol, which replaces the labeling requirement of caution, federal law. Prohibits dispensing without a prescription, a change created by the Food and Drug Administration. Modernization Act of 1997. Also included in this section are the sales restrictions imposed by the Prescription Drug Marketing Act of 1987 with respect to legend drug samples and coupons for legend drugs, together with the wholesaler licensing requirements. Finally, this section addresses drugs for veterinary use. This consumer update is brought to you by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. FDA regulates a wide range of products, including food and life-saving medicines. The agency helps safe and effective products reach the market and continues to monitor them for safety problems. Sometimes unforeseen problems make it necessary to recall a product that's already in widespread use. When an FDA-regulated product is either defective or potentially harmful, recalling the product, that is, removing from the market or correcting the problem, is the most effective way to protect the public. In most cases, a recall results from a mistake by the company, rather than from an intentional disregard for the law. FDA hears about problems regarding products that it regulates in several ways. A company discovers a problem and contacts FDA. FDA finds a problem during an inspection. FDA receives a report of problems through various reporting systems, or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention contacts FDA. FDA seeks publicity about a recall when it believes the public needs to be alerted to a serious hazard. The agency oversees a company's recall strategy and determines when the recall is complete. This is part of the agency's efforts to promote and protect the public health. If a recall product has been widely distributed, the news media is a very effective way to reach the public. Not all recalls are announced in the media, but all recalls go into FDA's weekly enforcement report. For more information on this and other health topics, visit fda.gov consumer.
This message is brought to you by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. How you been feeling, Mr. Brown? Pretty good. It's a scenario that plays out thousands of times a day in America. A doctor writes a prescription, and then the patient takes it to the pharmacist who fills it with a manufactured drug that is FDA approved. However, there are some people for whom this scenario does not work. Patients with special drug needs that can't be filled by FDA approved drugs. It's these patients who benefit from the practice known as compounding. Well, compounding is when a pharmacist prepares a product following the instructions of a licensed prescriber, uh, generally when the product is not available off the shelf. Traditionally, compounding was part of the time-honored relationship between doctor, patient, and pharmacist. The pharmacist modified a medicine to a doctor's specific prescription, adding or mixing ingredients to arrive at a custom drug aimed at a specific patient's needs. Today, more than 30 million prescription drugs are compounded annually, many by honest, hard-working pharmacists who provide a much-needed service to their patients, people who depend on compounded drugs as a medical necessity. She was about five and a half months old. She woke up in the middle of the night with a terrible cough, and by the next night, she was um, on a ventilator in the intensive care unit. What we discovered was that she had some rare anomalies, including um, she only had one lung and a very narrow trachea. So she went through extensive surgery to repair the airway. She was just so susceptible to infections, um, constantly getting sick. The antibiotics prescribed that any other parent can just go to the pharmacy and get were not going to work for her. So we had to have compounded medications. and. Um, I, don't, I don't know what we would have done otherwise. In this case, it's easy to see the importance of compounding and how it meets the medical need of an individual patient. But for all the good being done, patients may be exposed to dangers when using some compounded drugs. We're really concerned about the quality of compounded drugs that come from um, certain pharmacies. Not all of them are equipped to um, compound the correct way. Pharmacies that are regulated as pharmacies are not subject to FDA regulations on good manufacturing practices and they may not have the same types of controls that uh, FDA regulated drug manufacturers have. When you mix drugs together uh, that haven't been tested for example together they may inactivate each other, there may be drug interactions, um, they may degrade uh, more quickly the FDA approved product has been studied and looked at in that specific form. When you alter it, then you're changing its composition and you can't say whether it's intact anymore for the safety and efficacy. Bottom line is that a compounded drug has not really been tested to be safe and effective in clinical trials. We as pharmacists still evaluate the product and based on the doses used or the concentrations, we can feel reasonably confident that the product is safe to use. It may be difficult for a patient to know if the compounding is simple and can be done by most pharmacists, or whether special facilities may be necessary to ensure the safety of a compounded product. Take, for instance, a woman whose chronic back pain was finally eased by injections of a compounded drug that is normally taken in pill form for gout. She had been taking the medication for years until a calculation error made by the pharmacy led to an injection with eight times the normal dose. It was enough to kill her and at least two others who were given the drug. In that case, the pharmacy did not have appropriate quality controls and therefore released a super potent product um, and several patients were harmed as a result. While there are those who claim the risks to patients are non-existent, the FDA regularly sees reports of adverse events associated with compounded drugs. For us, it's very difficult because there may be lots of adverse events that are occurring when patients take compounded drugs. However, we're, we don't know about them. Here are some things to remember about compounded drugs and the pharmacies that make them. Compounded drugs are not FDA approved. 
they have not been proven safe and effective by the FDA. There are both risks and benefits associated with them. Know why you're taking a compounded drug over a conventional prescription medication. A pharmacy's FDA registration does not guarantee that its drugs are approved or its products are made under the stringent conditions required by FDA. Doctors should not substitute compounded drugs for FDA-approved ones unless there is a patient-specific medical necessity. Doctors should make it clear to the patient and pharmacist when a drug is to be compounded and why it is medically necessary. If you notice that the compounded product you receive from your pharmacy tastes, smells, or looks unusual, do not take it and report it to the pharmacy immediately. Report any adverse events associated with compounded drugs to FDA through the MedWatch program. FDA is trying to ensure that all drugs that, that U.S. consumers get are safe, effective, and high quality. FDA is committed to protecting and promoting the public health. Keeping these tips in mind should help pharmacy compounding to remain a safe and viable solution for those who need it. Three five three A, pharmacy compounding. This section was added to the FDCA by the Food and Drug Administration Modernization Act of 1997. However, in an April 29, 2002, opinion, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled the section unconstitutional in the case of Thompson ETAL v. Western States Medical Center ETAL 535 U.S. 357. Other sections of the FDCA address pharmacy compounding, however. The MPJE candidate should be very familiar with the Federal Law on Pharmacy Compounding. A good source for the U.S. Supreme Court opinion and other materials, particularly the FDA Compliance Policy Guidance on Pharmacy Compounding, is the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at www.fda.gov slash drug slash guidance compliance regulator e information slash pharmacy compounding slash default dot hdm. The MPJE candidate should be certain to review the FDA compliance guide on pharmacy compounding. Available at www.fda.gov slash download slash about FDA slash centers 0 f vices slash cder slash ucm 118050.pdf 354 Veterinary Feed Directive Drugs This section defines what is meant by a veterinary feed directive drug and sets forth requirements in relation to use and labeling of such drugs. 355 New Drugs This quite lengthy section sets forth the requirements and process for approval of a new drug through filling of a new drug application or abbreviated new drug application. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the process for approval of drugs and note PA particularly in this section the definition and use of the terms bioavailability and bioequivalent. The references listed in section 20 to 2 provide a good Overview of the Drug Approval Process 355A Pediatric Studies of Drugs This section authorizes the HHS Secretary to request pediatric studies, which are defined in this section. From the holder of an approved application for a new or previously approved drug, where the drug may produce health benefits in the pediatric population. If the holder of the approved application completes the studies, the holder will be granted additional market exclusivity, through extension of patent life for the periods described in this SE session, for the drug. Finally, this section establishes requirements relative to the conducting of pediatric studies. 355b. Adverse Event Reporting This section requires that the label of a prescription drug contain a toll-free number maintained by HHS to receive reports of adverse events regarding drugs. 355C Research into pediatric uses for drugs and biological products 
This section contains several requirements in relation to assessing the safety and effectiveness of drugs and biological products in pediatric patients and to support dosing and administration of drugs and biological products in pediatric patients. 356. Fast Track Products. This section authorizes the HHS Secretary, at the request of the sponsor of a new drug, to facilitate the development and expedite the review of the drug if it is intended for the treatment of a serious or life-threatening condition and if it demonstrates the potential to address unmet medical needs for such a condition, which serves as the definition of a fast-track product. 356A. Manufacturing Changes. This section describes manufacturing changes and sets forth those changes that require filing of a supplemental application and those that do not. 356B. Reports of Post-Marketing Studies. This section establishes the requirements for post-marketing studies where the sponsor of a drug has entered into an agreement with the HHS Secretary to conduct such a study. 356C. Discontinuance of Life-Saving Drug. This section creates the requirement that the sole manufacturer of a drug that has an approved application and that was not originally derived from human tissue and was replaced with recombinant product, and that is life-supporting, life-sustaining, or intended for use in the prevention of a debilitating disease or condition, notify the HHS Secretary of Discontinuance of Manufacture of the product at least six months prior to the discontinuance date. Reduction in the six-month notice requirement is authorized in certain circumstances, as described in this section. 358. Authority to designate official names. This section authorizes the HHS Secretary to designate an official name for a drug or device, except where the official name infringes a valid trademark. It also contains a requirement that the HHS Secretary review. Official names in the United States Pharmacopoeia, the Homeopathic Pharmacopoeia, and the National Formulary to determine whether revision of those names is necessary or desirable. Finally, in such reviews, the HHS Secretary is required to make determinations in relation to the designation of an official name based on complexity, usefulness, multiplicity, or lack of a name. 359. Non-applicability of subchapter to cosmetics. As the title of this section states, nothing in this subchapter applies to cosmetics, unless the cosmetic is also a drug or device or component of a drug or device. 360. Registration of producers of drugs or devices. This section establishes the registration and drug listing and national drug code requirements for drug manufacturers. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the National Drug Code System. Significantly, this section, at, g, l, exempts pharmacies and certain others from the re requirements under the conditions stated. 360B. New Animal Drugs. As with drugs for human use, the MPJE candidate should be familiar with new animal drugs under the FDCA, as described in this lengthy section. 360C. Classification of devices intended for human use. The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the FDCA provisions related to devices. This section establishes three classes of devices, as follows. Class I, General Controls. Class II, Special Controls. Class III, Premarket Approval. This section also sets forth the standards for determination of the safety and effectiveness of a device and provides for classification panel organization and operation. 360D. Performance Standards. This section establishes performance standards for Class II and in some cases Class III devices and the procedures for establishing and recognizing the standards. 360E. Premarket Approval. This section establishes the requirements and procedures for an application for pre-market approval of a Class III device. 360F. Banned Devices. 
This section authorizes the HHS Secretary to promulgate regulations to ban certain devices, as described. In this section, 360 grams. Judicial Review This section sets forth the procedures for judicial review of decisions of the HHS Secretary with regard to devices, 360H, notification and other remedies. This section provides that when a device presents an unreasonable risk of substantial harm and notification is necessary to eliminate the risk of harm, the HHS SC Secretary may issue an order to ensure that adequate notification is provided, in an appropriate form, by the persons and means best suited under the circumstances involved to all health professionals who prescribe or use the device and to any other person, including manufacturers, importers, distributors, retailers, and device users, who should properly receive such a notification to eliminate such a risk. This section also authorizes the HHS Secretary to order the manufacturer of a device to repair, replace, or make refund for the device. Finally, this section gives the HHS Secretary authority to order a recall of a device. 360I Records and Reports on Devices This section requires reports, as described in the SE session, from device manufacturers and device user facilities, such as hospitals. It also authorizes the HHS Secretary to order a device manufacturer to adopt a method for tracking certain Class II and III devices. 360J General Provisions Respecting Control of Devices Intended for Human Use This section contains a variety of requirements, including provisions for custom devices, restricted devices, good manufacturing practice requirements, and exemption of devices for investigational use. 360K State and Local Requirements Respecting Devices This section establishes the relationship between the FDCA provisions on devices and any state laws that may exist in relation to devices. 3601 Post-Market Surveillance This section authorizes the HHS Secretary to impose on manufacturers of certain devices various post-marketing surveillance requirements related to devices. 360M Accredited Persons This section requires the HHS Secretary to establish an accreditation program as described in the section for persons who review reports related to devices. Part B Drugs Tor Rare Diseases or Conditions 360AA Recommendations for Investigations of Drugs for Rare Diseases or Conditions this section provides that a sponsor of a drug for a disease or condition that is rare may request the HHS Secretary to provide written recommendations for the non-clinical and clinical investigations that must be conducted with the drug before it may be approved for treatment of such a disease or condition or, if the drug is a biological product, before it may be licensed for such disease or condition. 360BB Designation of Drugs for Rare Diseases or Conditions This section allows a manufacturer or sponsor of a drug to request, prior to submission of an application. For approval, the HHS Secretary to designate the drug as a drug for a rare disease or condition. This section defines a rare disease or condition as any disease or condition that affects, 1, fewer than 200,000 persons in the United States or, 2, more than 200,000 persons in the United States provided that there is no reasonable expectation that the cost of developing and making available in the United States a drug for such a disease or condition will be recovered from sales in the United States. It also contains a requirement for notice to the HHS Secretary for discontinuance of production of the drug. 360 cubic centimeters protection for drugs for rare diseases or conditions. This section provides that if the HHS Secretary AP proves an application for a drug designated for a rare disease or condition, the HHS Secretary may not AP prove another application for such a drug for such a disease or condition for a person who is not the holder of the approved application until the expiration of seven years from the date of approval, unless, 
1. The holder of the approved application cannot ensure the availability of sufficient quantities of the drug to meet the needs of people with the disease or condition for which the drug was designated or, 2. The holder provides the HHS secretary written consent for the AP approval of other applications before the expiration of the seven-year period. 360DD Open Protocols for Investigations of Drugs for Rare Diseases or Conditions This section provides, under certain circumstances, for the HHS Secretary to encourage the sponsor of a drug designated for a rare disease or condition to design protocols for clinical investigations of the drug. That may be conducted to permit the addition to the investigations of people with the disease or condition who need the drug to treat the disease or condition and who cannot be satisfactorily treated by available alternative drugs. 360E Grants and Contracts for Development of Drugs for Rare Diseases and Conditions This section authorizes the HHS Secretary to make grants to and enter into contracts with public and private entities and individuals to assist in defraying the costs of qualified testing expenses incurred in connection with the development of drugs for rare diseases and conditions, of development of medical devices for rare diseases or conditions, and of development of medical foods, a food formulated to be consumed or administered enterally under the supervision of a physician, for rare diseases or conditions. Part D Dissemination of Treatment Information When Sections 360AAA 360AAA 6 were enacted, Congress provided that they were to sunset, cease effectiveness, in 2006. Related to this, the FDA has published a guidance for industry on good reprint practices. The guidance is available at www.fda.gov slash oc slash op slash goodreprint.html. Although the text of the SE sessions remains in the U.S. Code, Rather than review the sections, the MPJE candidate should review the FDA guidance to gain general understanding of requirements and limitations associated with dissemination of treatment information. Part E General Provisions Relating to Drugs and Devices 360BBB Expanded Access to Unapproved Therapies and Diagnostics this section authorizes the HHS Secretary to allow shipment of investigational drugs or investigational devices for the diagnosis, monitoring, or treatment of a serious disease or condition in emergency situations. Furthermore, an individual patient, acting through a physician, may request from a manufacturer or distributor an investigational drug or device for the diagnosis, monitoring, or treatment of a serious disease or condition if a number of conditions, as set forth in this section, are fulfilled. 360 BBB 1. Dispute Resolution This section requires the HHS Secretary to establish a procedure for a sponsor, applicant, or manufacturer to obtain a review, including by a scientific advisory panel, in situations in which there is a scientific controversy with the HHS Secretary. 360 BBB2 Classification of Products This section provides that a person submitting an AP application for a product may submit a request to the HHS Secretary with respect to the classification of the product as a drug, a biological product, a device, or a combination or with respect to the component of the FDA that will regulate the product. In submitting the request, the person shall recommend a classification for the product or a component to regulate the product, as appropriate. This section also describes what action the HHS Secretary shall take in response to filing of such a request. 360 BBB 3 Authorization for Medical Products for Use in Emergencies this section provides for the use of unapproved drugs, devices, and biological products and for the use of approved drugs, devices, and biological products for unapproved uses in the event of an emergency. Part F New Animal Drugs Tour Minor Use and Minor Species 360 CCC Conditional Approval of New Animal Drugs for Minor Use and Minor Species 
This section authorizes conditional approval of a new animal drug for a minor use or a minor species. Included are the requirements associated with application for approval and limitations on seeking. Approval 360 CCC1 Index of Legally Marketed Unapproved New Animal Drugs for Minor Species This section requires the Secretary of HHS to establish a list of 1. New animal drugs intended for use in a Minor species for which there is a reasonable certainty that the animal or edible products from the animal will not be consumed by humans or food producing animals and 2. New animal drugs intended for use only in a hatchery, tank, pond, or other similar contained human-made structure in an early, non-food life stage of a food-producing minor species, where safety for humans is demonstrated. 360 CCC2 Designated New Animal Drugs for Minor Use or Minor Species This section provides that the manufacturer or sponsor of a new animal drug for a minor use or use in a Minor species may request the Secretary of HHS to declare that drug a designated new animal drug. Subchapter 6 Cosmetics The MPJE candidate should review the three sections, 361 to 363, contained in this subchapter on Cosmetics. The last three subchapters of Chapter 9 contain a variety of sections, many of which are not of Interest to the MPJE candidate. As directed in section 20 to 2, the candidate should open each subchapter. And from the titles of the parts and sections determine those that the MPJE candidate should review. Regulations of the US FDA. The FDA regulations may be found in Title 21 of the CFR. The body of FDA regulations is divided into subchapters as follows. Subchapter A General, 21 CFR Parts 1 to 99. Subchapter B Food for Human Consumption, 21 CFR Parts 100 to 199. Subchapter C Drugs, General, 21 CFR 200 to 299. Subchapter D Drugs for Human Use, 21 CFR Parts 300 to 499. Subchapter E Animal Drugs, Feeds, and Related Products, 21 CFR Parts 500 to 599. Subchapter F Biologics, 21 CFR Parts 600 to 699. Subchapter G Cosmetics, 21 CFR Parts 700 to 799. Subchapter H Medical Devices, 21 CFR Parts 800 to 899. Subchapter I Mammography Quality Standards Act, 21 CFR Parts 900 to 999. Subchapter J Radiological Health, 21 CFR Parts 1000 to 1099. Subchapter K Reserved. Subchapter L Regulations under certain other acts, 21 CFR Parts 1200 to 1299. The MPJE candidate should review relevant FDA regulations on the electronic database as described in Section 20 to 2. 25 The Poison Prevention Packing Act of 1970 and Regulations of the US CPSC. The Poison Prevention Packaging Act, PPPA, enacted by Congress in 1970, has as its purpose preventing poisonings in children under 5 years of age. This purpose is achieved through numerous requirements in the Act and CPSC regulations. The PPPA establishes packaging requirements for certain household products. Included among these products are both prescription and non-prescription drug products. Key provisions of the PPPA The MPJE candidate should be familiar with the packaging requirements contained in the PPPA and the regulations of the CPSC. The PPPA is located at Chapter 39A of Title 15 of the United States Code. The MPJE candidate should retrieve and review the sections contained in Chapter 39A as described in Section 20-2 Regulations of the U.S. CPSC The CPSC regulations may be found at Part 1700 of Title 16 of the CFR. The MPJE candidate should 
Retrieve and review the sections contained in Part 1700 as described in Section 20-2. As mentioned earlier, the MPJE candidate is encouraged to review the CPSC publication Poison. Prevention Packaging, a guide for healthcare professionals, available at www.cpsc.gov slash cpsc pub slash pub slash 384.pdf 20-6 Miscellaneous Federal Laws Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990 The Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990, more commonly referred to as OBRA 90, required the states to enact laws to require patient profiling, prospective drug use review, and patient counseling by pharmacies. Although the federal mandate AP applied only to the provision of pharmacy services to Medicaid beneficiaries, the states extended application of the requirements to all pharmacy patients. The MPJE candidate should review state law on these requirements, and the federal regulations may be found beginning at Section 45 CFR 456.700. Anti-Tampering Act of Hello and welcome to another edition of Keeping You Healthy. I'm Thomas Johnson, President and CEO of the Medicaid Health Plans of America. In commemoration of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America's Asthma and Allergy Awareness Month, we continue our series of highlighting best practices at Medicaid Health Plans with Horizon New Jersey Health's Asthma Management Improvement through Drug Utilization Review. According to the CDC, in the U.S., 17.5 million adults and 7.1 million children almost one in 10 kids, currently have asthma. To make sure that their members were controlling their asthma properly, Horizon New Jersey Health started Asthma Management Improvement Through Drug Utilization Review. Here today to discuss the program is our Keeping You Healthy correspondent, Michelle Katz, and our guest, Sam Curry, Director of Pharmacy Services at Horizon New Jersey Health. Michelle? Thank you, Thomas. And Sam, what is the Drug Utilization Review Program? Drug utilization review is a generic term. It can be used to, uh, to, to analyze drug therapy to ensure that it's being maximized or optimized for a given disease state. It can be done for diabetes. It can be done for antimicrobial therapy. It can be done for almost any disease that has a, a pharmacotherapy component. In this instance, we specifically did it around asthma. Why did um, Horizon NJ Health choose to use this mm -hmm. rather than others for asthma? Well, uh, drug therapy is central to the disease state, asthma. Um, and it, asthma lends itself to, to optimize drug therapy. Um, it, you know, folks that are instituted on appropriate pharmacotherapy early on have better outcomes. They're able to uh, have relief of symptoms and they're able to have a superb quality of life. Not all disease states uh, are like that, but asthma is very amenable to optimize, optimized drug therapy. When you say optimize, what, what do you mean? I... Well, optimized drug therapy, in this instance, our focus was, uh, was consistent with guidelines that are actually published by the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health uh, clearly states that, that inhaled corticosteroid drug therapy is the preferred controller therapy for asthma. So our core message to members and providers is that's where they should be gravitating. Those are the kind of therapies that should be instituted for optimal outcomes. So Sam, you mentioned these guidelines. How did you combine them with, let's say, the interventions of the program? Well, they were, they were pivotal. They were central to the intervention that we performed because the core message to members and providers was that we really wanted to make sure that there was institution 
of control of drug therapy that was consistent with what's recommended by the national guidelines coming out of the National Institutes of Health. That was the core message. Um, that, was, that was pivotal because getting members on the right therapy early on ultimately leads to better outcomes, better um, asthma control, and uh, enhanced quality of life. Just how receptive were your members as well as your providers with this program? Oh, very receptive. When we ask physicians about the validity of the information that we provide them, and we ask them the information that we provide them, how useful it is, the responses have been stellar. They tell us consistently, more than 75% of the time, that the information we provide them is relevant and either useful or extremely useful. It's not uncommon for a physician to contact us subsequent to them getting the information we provide to them. And they tell us, you know, uh, when they review the profile that we, that we provide them of the member's utilization, it's not uncommon for them to tell us, boy, I, I had no idea what the profile looked like. I had no idea that the member wasn't, wasn't utilizing the appropriate drug therapy that I had prescribed for them. Or even more commonly, we'll have physicians that will contact us and say, wow, I had no idea that the member, would, to what extent they were using a short-acting beta agonist or rescue therapy. That's just not appropriate. That's not something that should be happening. And I guess even more important, what were your outcomes on this program? The reason why at NJ Health we, we do this, this drug utilization review program on an ongoing basis is because the outcomes have just been so stellar year after year. What we find is that when we specifically detail to a physician the prescribing that's inconsistent with national guidelines, more than 25% of the time they modify that patient's drug therapy in, in, uh, consistent with the guidelines. Uh, and even more notable is the fact that we see a 50% or more reduction in rescue drug therapy. Uh, that reduction in drug therapy is, is a definitive marker for asthma control and members being able to effectively manage their disease state. Now that's quality health care. And thank you so much. Congratulations to you as well as Horizon NJ Health. And now back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Michelle and Sam. For further information, visit our website at www.mhpa.org. Thanks for joining us today. See you next time on Keeping You Healthy. For MHPA, I'm Thomas Johnson. Hi. Hi. Pick up a prescription. Oh, okay. And what's your name? Uh, Seedorf, Larry Seedorf. Hi, Mr. Seedorf. My name's Dave. It's nice to meet you. I'm your pharmacist here today. Okay. Are you picking up for yourself today or for somebody else? Yes, yeah, for me. For you. Great. I see you have a new prescription here. So what I'd like to do is take about five minutes, just go over some key points about this medication, how to take it, and answer any questions that you might have so you're feeling comfortable with this medication. All right. Does that sound all right? Yeah. Why don't you have a seat here? Sure. So to start off, I'm just going to verify your information real quick. So we <laughs> okay. said your name's Larry Seedorf. Um, is your date of birth, let's see. Uh, 12968. Okay. And it looks like, are you still on uh, same address as before? Yeah, on Pinnacle. Pinnacle, okay. Mm -hmm. And I have here, according to your profile, that you have um, a sensitivity to statins, which is a type of medications. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And according to your profile, it looks like you're taking like Cinepril, hydrochlorothiazide, and Simvastatin, which is one of those medications. Yeah, I'm not taking the Simvastatin not anymore. Not taking it anymore. Okay, great. No yeah. problem then. What happened when you took the statin? Uh, you know, I started to get uh, really bad pain in my legs, okay. uh, and that's what led me to go to the doctor. He ran tests, and that's when he said I had sensitivity to it. Okay. Well, hopefully you won't have any issues like that with this one. I'll be sure to go yeah. over this with you. Okay. Okay, so the name of this medication is Gemfibrazil. It's the generic for Lopid. Okay. Um, now, before I go into more detail about this medication, what concerns do you have that you'd like me to address with you here today? Uh, honestly, the, the pain in my legs, I'm a landscaper, mm -hmm. so it, it made it so that I could work. 
So, I mean, that's my biggest concern. The doctor said, you know, that, that it would help to be on this instead. Certainly, so. I understand that. And hopefully you won't have the same issues with this one. Uh, we'll talk about that. Before I get to that, though, what did your doctor say this medication is used for? Uh, lower cholesterol, you know, something about triglycerides. Absolutely. You see this a lot with uh, lowering cholesterol, especially triglycerides, which are a type of cholesterol. Okay. Now, how did your doctor tell you that you're going to use this medication? Uh, twice a day twice a day. So you'll take one tablet, which is 600 milligrams. And just like it says on here, it's actually two tablets. So you'll be taking okay. a total of 1200 milligrams and you'll be doing that by mouth twice a day. So the best time to take it is about a half hour before breakfast. And then again, a half hour before dinner, if you can remember that. Yeah. The important thing is just to remember that you're taking it regularly twice a day. If you can't do it exactly a half an hour, that's okay. As long as you're taking it okay. regularly. Okay, cool. Okay. Now, um, one important thing about this medication is this is in addition to diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. So keep doing that healthy diet, all that exercise to help lower your cholesterol as well. All right. Okay. Now, what side effects did your doctor tell you that this medication may cause? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he, you know, he did say that hopefully it would be better for my, my legs. Right. You know. Hopefully it will. Now, it's still possible it may cause that. You are on kind of a high dose. Most people do fine on it. I mean, okay. it's a different, it works in a different way than the statin. So if you experience that, just let your doctor know, but most people do do fine. Okay. okay. Right. Now, other side effects you might experience, um, you might have a little bit of stomach upset. Uh -huh. If that happens, just take it with food and that should help. Okay. Okay. As far as storing it, keep it in this bottle. That'll protect it from light and from moisture. Keep it at room temperature, you know, nothing fancy. Yeah. Um, and you do have three refills on here. Okay. So um, once you're getting low, go ahead and give us a call. We'll be happy to get you your refill. Okay. All right, great. Now, I've given you a lot of information. Yeah. Just to be sure that I've explained everything, how are you going to take this medication? Uh, take it, what, two pills twice a day, um, before meals. Um, yeah, right. Yep, you've got it. Okay. Very good. What questions do you have for me about this medication? I, you know, I mean, I just hope that the, it doesn't cause the pain. I mean, obviously, you know, it's frustrating Absolutely. to yes. not yes. have any problems and then start taking medicine and starting to have problems. Absolutely. So. I understand your frustration. Yeah. Try to stick with it, you know, because it is important we lower your cholesterol. Um, but like I said, if you start to notice any muscle pain, let your doctor know. There's other options. He may be able to switch you. And most people do do just fine on it. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Great. Uh, what other questions do you have for me? I think that's it. I think we're good. All right. Very good. So just to kind of summarize, mm -hmm. make sure that you kind of stick with it. If you do start to notice any muddle, muscle pain, make sure you report that right away. Yeah. Um, take it a half hour before breakfast and again a half hour before dinner mm -hmm. if you can, but it's important just remember to take that twice a day uh, okay. kind of regularly. Great. All right. If anything else comes up at all, our number is right here on the bottle. Okay. So go ahead and give us a call. Again, my name is Dave, and I'd be happy to help you. Um, any of the other pharmacists would also be willing to help you as well, just in case I'm not in. So okay. go ahead and give us a call. Great. All Sounds right. Good. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah. All right. Time. Thank you, Mr. Seedorf. Take thank care. You. Anti-Tampering Act of 1982 This act makes tampering with consumer products a federal offense and was passed as a result of a series of incidents of intentional contamination of Tylenol capsules while held for sale in retail establishments. Regulatory authority resides with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and FDA. Regulations for specific types of products may be retrieved as described in Section 20-2, and reviewed as follows. Over-the-counter drug products, 21 CFR 211.132. Medical devices, 21 CFR 800.12. Cosmetics, 21 CFR 700.25. Federal Law on Medicinal Use of Alcohol. Under federal law, Retailers that sell alcohol are subject to an annual tax, and to handle any type of alcohol. A license from the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is required. Retailers selling take-home. Liquors are required to obtain a federal retail liquor dealer's stamp. In a community pharmacy, if the alcohol is sold only for medicinal purposes, a federal medicinal spirits dealer's stamp may be obtained. Instead of the retail liquor dealer's stamp, some pharmacies require much larger volumes, usually obtained in 10 or 55 gallon drums of alcohol, and the alcohol can be purchased tax free. However, 
they. Use of tax-free alcohol is subject to a number of federal law restrictions. The alcohol must be used for medicinal or scientific purposes or for patient treatment. The alcohol must not be sold or loaned to other pharmacies or other practitioners. The alcohol, whether in pure form or in combination with other substances, must not be sold to outpatients, with the exception of non-profit clin ICS, as long as the patient is not charged. The alcohol must be kept in a secure, fire-resistant room. A perpetual inventory of the alcohol stock must be maintained. For additional information, the MPJE candidate can review the sections beginning at 27 CFR 22.1, as described in Section 20-2.